Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on Programming in Go. So in this segment I want to talk about the next piece of object-oriented capability in Go. Last time I talked about methods and interfaces and now I want to talk about struct composition. And that lets us build up structs from other structs. It's a thing that's kind of unique to Go. And as I do that I'll explain why composition is not inheritance. So I'm going to do most of this segment in the playground, but before I do that, I want to start with one slide to explain the concept of composition. And what I have on this slide is I have a struct, which is perfectly normal, pair, and then I have another struct which may look a little weird, pair with length. And pair with length has in it pair. Now normally in a struct you have a field name and then the type of the field, but here what we have is a type. Pair is a type, it's a struct type. And it's just here by itself without a field name. So we have a field without a name, but it has a type. And what happens is that type becomes embedded inside pair with length. Now, the simplest way of explaining this, again, is to use structs and to say that the fields of pair get promoted into pair with length. All right, and this word promoted is really kind of important because we're going to see other things get promoted also. But what do I mean by promotion? Well, it means that the fields of pair appear at the same level as the fields of pair with length. So I can access, you know, pl.length makes sense, right? pl is a pair with length object. But what about pl.path? In most languages, you know, if I have a struct within a struct, I need more dot notation. I need to go do x.y.z to get down to some field. Right? But we don't do that in Go because the embedding causes the fields of pair to be promoted to the same level as pair with length. Okay? So that's part of it. That's not all of the story, but that's the beginning of it. And that's the notion of composition. Right? We could do composition by having pair with length have two fields and give each field a name. And that works. And then we'd have to use all that dot notation. But there's an advantage to promotion, because in a second you're going to see not only do we promote fields, we promote methods. Okay, before I move on, I need to add one thing to this, because I don't want to leave you with the impression that a struct has to embed another struct, right? Remember last time we had a type, I think it was int slice, for example, which was defined as a slice of int. So the question is, can I embed an int slice in here? And the answer is yes. Now, an int slice doesn't have struct fields, so there's no struct fields to promote. But I can embed a type within another type, even if it's not a struct. And in the playground, I kind of want to demonstrate a little of this. So I've copied over a bit of this so far, right? We have the pair struct, and pair has a method string, which is fine. So if I run this program, because pair has a string method, it doesn't just print out the fields of pair in the usual way. It prints out the string that I generate. Fine. So now we're going to add the next type, of course, pair with length. Right, and as I said before, we're going to embed a pair, and then we'll add a, like a length field with int. Fine. Now I'm going to create one, and the question is, first of all, what do I have to put inside, um, curly braces, what do I have to put inside my literal when I make this? And the answer is, I can't just put all the fields. So this is the one exception to the promotion thing, that when I create this, I'm going to have to give it a pair and a length. Okay, I don't know, 3 or 113 or something. Okay? And in my pair, I'll have to give it some fields. All right, so I still have to, when I make one with a literal, I have to actually call out the pair as a separate thing and put it in. So we printed P, we'll print PL, but we can also print parts of PL. And of course, it's no surprise if I can print PL.length, right? But I can also print PL.path as I showed in the slides, all right? So the path field is immediately available. I don't have to print pl dot something dot something whatever. All right. But now the question is, 
When I go to print PL by itself, what do I get? And the answer is, it looks like what I printed for P. Why is that? Well, there's another kind of promotion. So the fields of pair get promoted to pair with length. So do the methods. Okay? The methods of pair, and so one of those methods is the string method, gets promoted to pair with length. So when I go to print pair with length, again, it has a string method. Now, here's one of the gotchas, and this should be no surprise whatsoever, right? The pair with length string method is the one from pair which knows about fields in pair, right? I can't go back, for example, and add p dot length because pair didn't have a length, right? So I'm going to get the method that runs on pair with length, but it operates on the pair part, essentially. It does the logic it would have done for pair. It doesn't know anything about the length. Okay, good. But what happens if I create a new string method, right? So I have pair with length. I'm going to copy so much of this. Okay, so now I have a string method specifically for pair with length. And the answer is when I run this, I'm going to see that for pair with length, it uses a different method. All right, so when it goes to resolve these methods, it says, okay, is there a string method on pair with length? Well, if there's one defined for the pair with length type specifically, it's going to use that. If not, it's going to look to see if there was a string method promoted into pair with length. That's what it did before. So before it called the one from pair, but now since I actually have one on pair with length specifically, okay, and I'm trying very hard to avoid using the word override, okay, because that's not normally a term we use in Go. And the reason we don't use it is because override again suggests inheritance. And we're not doing inheritance here because a pair with length is not a subclass of pair. It is not a subtype of pair. And I want to demonstrate that here. So we'll, we'll go and do the next little piece of this. All right, and we're going to call it func file name. It takes a p pair, returns a string. <clears throat> and it's going to return And I'm just going to run the, the path through something called file path, which is a something that operates on paths. It doesn't really matter here. Okay, but file name takes a pair. Okay, so the question is, what happens if I do fump.println? Okay, so we'll try file name on p, and we'll run that. And the result's not terribly surprising, right? I'm going to try running that on PL. And that's going to fail. Because a pair with length cannot be passed as a parameter of type pair. It's not the same thing. It's not a subtype. It's not the same type, even though pair with length has a pair within it. But what I could do, and this is legal, is I could actually say PL.pair. And so I'm just calling out that embedded pair part. And if I do that, that works. Right? But I couldn't do just PL by itself, right? If I run that, it's, it's an incompatible type, right? So composition and inheritance are two different things. Because normally you have inheritance, you pick up the fields from the parent class, but you are a, a subclass of the parent class. And in Go, we don't have inheritance. So we're pulling in the fields of pair, they're embedded into pair with length, we're promoting fields and methods into pair with length, but pair with length is a different type. Now, we'll get around that, and we get around that with interfaces, right? So now I'm going to go create an interface. I'm going to create an interface called FileNamer, which is going to take a method file name. And we're going to change this file name up here to be a method instead of a function. 
right? So it takes a path, it takes a pair, returns the file name. Great. So now I would have to do this as p.filename, for example, and that runs. Whoop. Keywords, keywords, keywords. All right, no surprise. So now what happens if I create a new variable All right, so p.filename is fine. It's going to complain that I didn't use fn. So we'll use it for just a second. Okay. Run that. Now, this, this assignment worked. Why? All right, and we're going to run that. That also works because obviously fn is a file name. It has a file name method. But this assignment right here is the thing we're interested in, right? A pair with length is a file namer. Why? Well, the, the file name method was on pair, but that method was promoted into pair with length. Interfaces are how we get around this issue of, you know, I had the file name function. It took a pair parameter. That was a concrete type. And pair with length is a different concrete type. But when I start creating an interface like FileNamer, okay, now both pair and pair with length can be examples of FileNamer, in this case, because the method was promoted into pair with length. But we could have done it a different way. They could have been completely separate without composition. But composition allows us to build things up. And in a couple minutes, we're going to get to an example where we demonstrate the practical use of that, for example, in sorting. I'm going to go back to the slides for a second because I want to demonstrate that we can do composition not just with values, but with pointers. So I have struct fizzgig, which is an old joke, and it, it embeds a pair with length, but it doesn't embed the whole thing of pair with length. It embeds a pointer to pair with length. Okay, so fizzgig has a pointer to a pair with length thing, and it has another field, broken, for example, right? Um, I will let you look up fizzgig and figure out what that actually is. So I can create this variable fg, and the way I create it is I actually pass in the address of something I created with pair with length. Right? So I created a pair with length thing by putting the ampersand in front of it. It gets allocated on the heap, and we get a pointer to it, and that pointer becomes part of my fizzgig instance. Right? So now what happens if I actually print the fizzgig? Well, the answer is it prints, and this is a slightly different version of, of, of the function, right? I, I have one in the slides. It was written a little different. So the text is not exactly the same. But notice it prints the length and the path and the hash. OK, why? Because it's calling the string method on pair with length because I embedded it. Even if I embedded it through a pointer, it is still in a sense, it's still allowing its methods to be promoted back into fizzgig. Okay, so fizzgig has a string method. It's a, it would fit into a fump.stringer, even though I embedded the pointer to the embedded type. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how Go does sorting, because Go has an interesting approach to doing sorting that's actually built off of interfaces and methods. And it allows us to provide a good example of how composition can be very, very handy. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk about what's actually defined in the standard library. It's an interface type, and it expects three methods. One provides a length, okay. One provides a swap function, which just says, you know, I'm going to sort some sequence, swap two elements, right. And the third one is less, which is some way of saying, hey, how do I compare two elements to decide whether they should be swapped? Right? So less takes two indices, and swap takes two indices. And we're assuming that what's being sorted is probably a slice. And so the sort function just takes the interface as its parameter. So here's an example of using sort. Now, 
sort has within it another thing called string slice. And string slice is just a way to cast a slice of strings into something that has those three methods. They're built in, in this case, for strings. They're built into the sort package. So I can create a slice of strings. I've got four strings here in some arbitrary order, right? And when I turn them into a sort.string slice, that's essentially a typecast, then I call sort.sort, .sort, and when they come out, they come out in the right order alphabetically. And I'm going to take this example from a presentation that Andrew Jaron did. It's a good presentation, so I'm going to borrow this concept. Right? We're going to have an organ type, and I'm going to define some methods on it. And at this point, it's time to go into the playground. So in the playground, I have the same stuff. Right? I have the organ struct, and organs have a name and a weight. So I have a liver, and it weighs a certain amount, and so on. Right? We're going to define a type organs, and organs is going to be a slice of organ. And the reason we do that is because we're putting these methods on organs, not on organ, singular, organs, plural, right? What is the length of organs? Well, it's the length of the slice, okay? If I swap, that's just one of these assignments, you know, and I don't have to have a function for swap. I can just use multiple assignment. The ij values become the ji values. Fine, right? So, and now I've got some organs. These are... <laughs> I hope I have more organs left than these, but they've taken some of them out already. And if I run this, right, I get printed out this list of organs in no particular order. Well, it's in the order I typed it in, but it's not sorted yet. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit more work, because I don't just want to sort these one way. I have two criteria, name and weight, right? So we're going to be a little tricky. I'm going to be able to sort them both ways. And to do that, I'm going to define two new types. So the first type, by name, <clears throat> and I'm going to type it this way just because that allows me to get a bit more on the screen when you read it. All right, so this is legal. This is not the best style, but that's all right. And you'll see these are exactly the same, by name and by weight. Each of these is a struct. It embeds organs. So it's a good thing we can embed things that aren't structs. I'm embedding a slice of organ, right? And the first thing you might want to think about is, okay, so I defined length and swap on organs. Those methods are also going to apply to by name and by weight. They're going to be promoted in because I embedded the organs type inside by name and by weight. What's going to be different is I need two different methods, all right, to do the less. And the way less works is it takes two integers and returns a bool, right? So I need to do this once for by name and once for by weight. And the only difference is going to be that in the first case, All I'm going to do is compare the names, right? So one organ is less than the other in by name if one name is less, presumably by alphabetic, right? An alphabetical order. And for by weight, we'll do the same thing, but instead of the name, we'll use the weight, right? So less on by name compares names, less on by weight compares weight, what about the other two methods? Well, they're, again, they're promoted in. So both by name and by weight are going to be compatible with the sort.interface type because they have all three methods. So we're going to see that. All right, I have my thing right here. Right Now, the other thing about sort.sort .sort is it does it in line. So I have to call sort.sort .sort Okay, so here's the thing. I'm going to take S, which is my slice of organs. I'm going to construct a by weight with the organs in it, and I'm going to sort that. And then I'm going to print it out. And then I'm going to do the same thing uh, 
except by name, and we're going to see the result. Mm. As soon as I import the sort package. And it's very clear, right? The first one, it sorts by weight ascending, so the heaviest one is last. And the second one, it's sorted by name ascending again, so the one with the earliest letter in the alphabet, B comes before H comes before L, they're both sorted in different orders. Now, what's important here is, again, the sort function is in line. So what I couldn't do is sort them twice and then try to print them, because the first sort would get replaced by the second sort, right? S would get sorted, and then S would get resorted, and then we'd print it out. So we have to make sure we print it before we sort it again. Or we'd have to copy it to another slice or something, right? But if I do it this way, I get what I expect. So this is a great example of composition, because by name and by weight embed the organs type. Organs is a slice of organ with methods on it. Those methods are promoted into by name and by weight, and all I had to do was specialize the less method. Now there's one other thing I want to show about sorting, just to kind of round this out. And that is, there is a reverse. Sort.reverse is literally just a struct that embeds interface. Now interface was the, the sorting type that said you had to have three methods. Length, swap, and less. Right? Well, so what does reverse get? Well, first of all, reverse inherits, I'm sorry, I didn't use that word. The methods of interface are promoted into reverse. Okay? And then reverse redefines one. Okay? It redefines one, and all it does is it calls the interface less method with the indices reversed, ji instead of ij, which reverses the logic of less than. Okay? And then reverse is literally just a, a thing, the function reverse, which returns an interface which simply embeds your data into the reverse interface thing up here, which has this different method for less. And so all it does is it takes your less method and turns it backwards. Right? And if we look at how that actually does, let's go back to our example of strings. Well, now I took entries, I made a string slice, and then I made it into a reverse thing, and when I sort it, they all come out in the reverse alphabetical order. Okay? So this is another example. We literally have within the sort package an example of using embedding, embedding an interface into a struct to pick up its methods, replace one of them. And then we actually have a function whose only job is essentially to create a new interface out of the old one by typecasting it, if you will. That's essentially what this is. It's sort of a typecast of whatever you passed in into a reverse thing, reversing your less method. So before I'm done with this segment, I want to have one more thing, right? We've had this ongoing theme about making nil useful, all right? And again, there was presentations that are worth watching out there about this idea. But I'm going to briefly give you a couple examples here. The first one is I'm going to create a type that represents a stack. And of course, a stack is one of these things where, you know, you put things on and the last one on is the first one off. You can only take things on and off from the top, right? Now, here's the thing. In my case, I'm going to use a struct. And there's two reasons for this. Um, actually, there's really one reason. Because no matter what I do, my string slice is going to be zeroed out as an empty string slice that I can work with. I can take its length, I can append to it, and so on. Actually, the real reason I put it in here is I don't want to expose from string stack how it works. Okay. So the one drawback in a few of these cases where we have um, wrapped another type like a slice of int, right? what we haven't done is necessarily encapsulate it. Now that's fine. For a type that's a slice of int, actually we still want to expose the idea it's a slice, because that way we can do things like the range operator and the index, right? the subscript operator. But for string stack, I don't want you to know how push and pop work. Right? So my data type inside here, notice it starts with a lowercase letter. So if I put string stack into a package and you import it, you see the type string stack, 
but you don't actually see the data field. It's not visible to you. It's encapsulated. So I've hidden away from you how this thing works internally. And what I've done instead is I've given you methods like push and pop, right? Um, I could give you a length method that would be trivial. I would just take and return the length of the, of the strings of the slice, pardon me. And, you know, I could possibly have a, a, a string function that printed it out in some way. I'm going to show push and pop. Now, the reason I'm showing push, for example, and this is the best example, is when I create a string stack, let's suppose I just declare a var, you know, var s string stack, right? Can I do an s dot push something? And the answer is yes. I can immediately do an s dot push because my string stack was created sort of ready to use. Right? The slice inside is empty, it's nil in fact, but I can append to it because I can append to a nil slice, it's ready to use. So as soon as you give me a value, I'm going to simply append it to my internal slice. And that's the push operation. Now, pop is a little more interesting, right? Because I have to have an if check. I don't want to try to pop off an empty stack. All right? And I've done it the way I've done it because I want to control how the error happens. I don't need the if check in the sense that if all we had was this piece in here, right, and it's empty, it's going to panic. But it's going to panic with a message that says, you know, index out of range type thing, all right, which is not that helpful unless you know there's a slice inside. And it actually helps reveal that there is a slice inside, which is something we didn't want to expose, right? So instead, I'm going to have a check. If it's non empty, I'm going to pop off what's in there. And if it is empty, I'm going to fall through to a panic. And this panic statement is an actual statement in the language, but it allows me to control the message. Instead of saying something about the slice having an index out of range, I'm simply going to say, hey, you tried to pop from an empty stack. And that's logically impossible. Okay, we haven't talked about panic yet, so this is kind of a preview, but I'll talk about that later. Essentially, right now, if we ran this in a program and tried to pop off an empty stack, we would crash we would crash with this message, pop from an empty stack. All right, if we're not doing that, then of course all I'm really doing in here is t is going to be whatever's at the end of the slice. And remember, I append to the end. So whatever you last appended is the last element on the slice. I'm going to get that into t, and then I'm going to turn my slice into the slice minus that element. So you can think of this as a tail and a head. Right? I'm going to get the tail of the list, put it in T, and then my list is going to become the head of the list without T. All right? And then I just return T, that's the value. All right? And this will work. I can push and pop, this is fine. It'll only work on strings, right? but that's why I called it a string stack. There's another aspect of making nil useful. And so I just want to say this in just so many words right here. I'm going to circle this right here. I'm going to put a star next to it. If I had a uh, a, a sparkler, I'd, I'd sit here with the sparkler sparkling, okay? Nothing prevents you from calling a method with a nil receiver, okay? Most languages, if you have some variable that represents an object and it's nil, and you try to call a method with that nil pointer, you die, right? Or you throw an exception or whatever, right? But that's, your program stops working right there. And that's not true in Go. We can have an interface that's nil, and you call a method on it, and it's up to you how that gets handled. Okay, and here's an example of a case where it's perfectly okay, right? I've got this int list, and in this case, it's going to be a linked list through pointers. And that's a data structure. If you're not familiar with it, you know, you have something and it points to the next something, right? They're not sequential in memory. And there's some advantages to that that I won't go into because this is not a data structures class. But let's just assume we have this type. Right? And somebody says, hey, I want to get the sum of all the integers in the list. Well, how do we do that? Well, we walk our way down the list. Now, what's interesting is we can do that recursively in the sense that right, I have a value, right, and then I have a field which represents the pointer to the rest of the list. I'm calling it tail. Right? I could have called the value head. That's also, there's languages that have head and tail very explicitly. But anyway, I have the value and I have the rest of the list in tail. So I can return the value plus the result of calculating the sum over the rest of the list, right? 
Now the problem is, how do I know the list is done? Well, we, the list is done when I get a tail that has the value nil, All right? It's just like trees. If you build a tree, how do you know a node has no children? Well, the po pointers to children are nil, and the linked list comes to an end when the tail pointer is nil. So that's why I have this logic here, right? If you call sum and you pass it the tail pointer and it's nil, I'm just going to return zero, which is very logical because if I have no more elements in the list, their sum is zero. And when I add zero to the rest of the sum, it doesn't change it, okay? So this is a very straightforward way to handle it. It just works. So I can just sit here and build this little linked list of int, int variables and then ask for the sum. It'll walk down the list, calculating the sum. When it gets to the end, it's done and returns. So I have made the nil value safe and useful. I don't have to worry about, oh, I called nil and it crashed. Now, not every type will work this way, but again, this is a paradigm. It changes the way you think about building things because we can do things with nil that are safe in ways that they weren't in other programming languages. And it just, again, the program becomes simpler. There's fewer error conditions to have to go and deal with. Okay, so that was my second part on object-oriented programming Go, right? The first part I talked about methods and interfaces, and now I've talked about composition and the notion of promotion, how the fields and methods of the embedded type get promoted to the embedding type. And it's a very powerful notion. It lets us build some very interesting programs, okay? But it's not inheritance. The embedding structure is not a subtype or a subclass of a parent. Okay, so composition and inheritance are two different things, and I think hopefully now you see that.